Hello, fellow adventurers thirsting for great books and music. It is I, the wandering fantasy author Jay Reckward, and this is Pondering the Orb. We have a great show today, so let's get started. But please remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And in the words of a great Italian, let's -a go. A war epic, a high fantasy full of unimaginable and taut sorcery, and a tale that inspired many of our favorite authors, including J.R.R. Tolkien. E.R. Edison's The Worm of Ouroboros is a classic novel important to the canon of epic fantasy and heroic fantasy. Detailing the war between the Lords of Demon Land and King Goris of Witchland, this book may present itself in a 16th century Elizabethan fashion, but it is a piece of modern fantasy and the notions that it explores with the themes of power, corruption, and the futility of both. Let's read from E.R. Edison's The Worm of Ouroboros, published in 1922. The Worm Ouroboros by E.R. Edison We are reading from the induction. There was a man named Lessingham, dwelt in an old low house in Wasdale, set in a gray old garden where yew trees flourished that had seen Vikings in Copeland in their seedling time. Lily and rose and larkspur bloomed in the borders, and begonias with blossoms big as saucers, red and white and pink and lemon color, and beds before the porch. Climbing roses, honeysuckle, clematias, and the scarlet flame flower scrambled up the walls. Thick woods were on every side without the garden with a gap northeastward opening on the desolate lake and the great fells beyond it, Gable rearing his crag-bound head against the sky from behind the straight, clean outline of the screes. Cool, long shadows stole across the tennis lawn. The air was golden. Doves murmured in the trees. Two chaffinches played on the near post of the net. A little water wagtailed scurry along the path. A French window stood open to the garden, showing darkly a dining room paneled with old oak, its Jacobean table bright with flowers and silver and cut glass, and wedgewood dishes heaped with fruit, green gadges, peaches, and green muscat grapes. Lessingham lay back in a hammock chair, watching through the blue smoke of an after-dinner cigar, the warm light on the Gloire Dijon, roses that clustered about the bedroom window overhead. He had her hand in his. This was their house. Should we finish that chapter of Najal, she said. She took the heavy volume in its faded green cover and read, He went out on the night of the Lord's Day, when nine weeks were still to winter. He heard a great crash, so that he thought both heaven and earth shook. Then he looked into the west airt, and he thought he saw hereabouts a ring of fiery hue, and within the ring a man on a gray horse. He passed quickly by him and rode hard. He had a flaming firebrand in his hand, and he rode so close to him that he could see him plainly. He was black as pitch, and he sung this song with a mighty voice. Here I ride, swift steed, his flanks flecked with rhyme. Rain from his mane drips, horse mighty from harm. Flames flare at each end, gal glows in the mist, so flares with Flossie's reeds as this flaming brand flies, and so flares with Flossie's reeds as this flaming brand flies. Then he thought he hurled the firebrand east towards the fells before him, and such a blaze of fire leapt up to meet it that he could not see the fells for the blaze seemed as though the man rode east among the flames and vanished there. After that he went to his bed, and was senseless for a long time, but at last he came to himself. He bore in mind all that had happened, and told his father, but bade him to tell it to Hjalti, Skiggy's son. So he went and told Hjalti. He said he had seen the wolf's ride, and that comes ever before great tidings. They were silent a while, then Lessingham said suddenly. Do you mind if we sleep in the east wing tonight? What, in the lotus room? Yes. I'm too much of a lazy bones tonight, dear, she answered. Do you mind if I go alone, then? I shall be back to breakfast. I like my lady with me still. We can go again when the next moon wanes. My pet is not frightened, is she? No, she said, laughing. But her eyes were a little big. Her fingers played with his watch chain. I'd rather, she said presently, you went later on and took me. All of this is so odd still, the house and that. 
and I love it so. And after all, it is a long way in several years, too, sometimes in the lilders' room, even though it is all over the next morning. I'd rather we went together. If anything happened, then, well, we'd be both done in, and it wouldn't matter so much, would it? Both be what, said Lessingham? I'm afraid your language is not all that might be wished. Well, you taught me, she said, and they laughed. They sat there till the shadows crept over the lawn and up the trees, and the high rocks of the mountain shoulder beyond burned red in the evening rays. He said, If you like to stroll a bit of the way up the failed side, Mercury is visible tonight. We might get a glimpse of him just after sunset. A little later, standing on the open hillside below the hawking bats, they watched for the dim planet that showed, at last low, down in the west between the sunset and the dark. He said, It is as if Mercury had a finger on me tonight, Mary. It's no good my trying to sleep tonight except in the lotus room. Her arm tightened in his. Mercury, she said. It's another world. It is too far. But he laughed and said, Nothing is too far. They turned back as the shadows deepened. As they stood in the dark of the arched gate leading from the open fell to the garden, the soft, clear notes of a spinet sounded from the house. She put up a finger. Hark, she said, your daughter is playing Les Barricades. They stood listening. She loves playing, he whispered. I'm glad we taught her to play. Presently, he whispered again, Les Barricades Mysteriosus. What inspired Caparin with that enchanted name? And only you and I know what it really means. Les Barricades Mysteriosus. That night, Lessingham lay alone in the lotus room. Its casements opened eastward on the sleeping woods and the sleeping bare slopes of Ilgil Head. He slept soft and deep, for that was the house of Post Meridian and the house of peace. It was the deep and dead time of the night when the waning moon peered over the mountain shoulder. He woke suddenly. The silver beam shone through the open window on a form perched at the foot of the bed. A little bird, black, round-headed, short-beaked, with long, sharp wings and eyes like two stars shining. It spoke and said, Time is. So Lessingham got up and muffled himself in a great cloak that lay on a chair beside his bed. He said, I'm ready, my little martlet. For this was the house of heart's desire. Surely the martlet's eyes filled all the room's starlight. It was an old room with lotuses carved on the panels and on the bed and the chairs and the roof beams. And in the glamour, the carved flowers swayed like water lilies in a lazy stream. He went to the window, and the little martlet sat on his shoulder. A chariot colored like the halo about the moon waited by the window, poised in the air, harnessed to a strange steed. A horse, it seemed, but winged like an eagle, and its four legs feathered and armed with eagle's claws instead of hooves. He entered the chariot, and that little martlet sat on his knee. With a whir of wings, the wild courser sprang skyward. The night about them was like the tumult of bubbles about a diver's ears diving into a deep pool under a smooth, steep rock in a mountain cataract. Time was swallowed up in speed, the world reeled, and it was but the space between two deep breaths that the strange courser spread his wide rainbow wings and slanted down the night over a great island that slumbered on a slumbering sea, with lesser isles about it, a country of rock mountains and hill pastures and many waters, all a glimmer in the moonshine. They landed within a gate covered with golden lions. Lessingham came down from the chariot, and the little black martlet circled about his head, showing him a yew avenue leading from the gates. As in the dream, he followed her. Lyndon Perry of Tula Fog Press has been a longtime promoter of sword and sorcery, including the all important SNS Roundup, a wonderful newsletter for authors, publishers, and readers alike. Now Tula Fog Press is going beyond their newsletter and launching Swords and Heroes, a digital only publication that is sending fresh sword and sorcery right into your email inboxes. I have linked to their sign-up and submission guidelines below, but to celebrate this new venture and wish it well, let's read from To Catch a Dragon's Eye by Lyndon Perry, featured in Swords and Heroes number zero. Featured in Swords and Heroes number zero, this is To Catch a Dragon's Eye by Lyndon Perry. 
Martin announced to his family, I'm headed to the dragon pools. Is it your day already? His mother, Cecilia, asked. Florian is ill, so the knight asked me to watch the waters this afternoon. Which you are only too eager to do, scorned his sister, Rezenti. Are you insinuating something? I am declaring that you are greedy, and it will get the best of you one day. Just be careful, his father, Rinaldo, said. Don't catch a Wavern's eye. I am not a child, Martin chided. If some drake happens to be admiring itself in its mirror, as they often do, I simply disturb the waters and go on to view the next dragon's lair. And you get paid a silver for just looking into the pools, Cecilia wondered, amazed. To a humble family that worked the land, a silver was quite the sum for a day's worth of gazing into a few pools of enchanted waters. But for the Night's Watcher, after what he had seen stockpile in those wyvern's caves, it wasn't nearly enough. The knight is generous, he said ambivalently. I'd best be off. Martin set out for the dragon pools, a nascent idea worming its way into the forefront of his mind. He talked himself into a daring plan as he walked to his assignment. Why should I alert the knight when a dragon's lair is left unattended, so that he might jump through the pool and steal the treasure himself? Yes, he rewards me with a recovered trinket. But what would it hurt if I did the deed myself? I'd be stealing from the drake, not the knight. Surely my master would never know, and I could provide my family with quite a boon. With that simple reasoning, it was decided. If he gazed into the waters and saw an unintended pile of treasure in a wavering's cavern, he would slip through the pool himself. It would take but a moment to fill a pouch with some gemstones and coins, then he would step through the dragon's mirror and come back through the magic waters, the knight none the wiser. How difficult could it be? He had seen his master perform the trick a number of times. When he arrived at the pools, his master admonished, as usual, "'Send up a flare when you spy an empty lair.' The knight chuckled at his daily instructional rhyme and departed, leaving Martin alone to modern the smattering of ensorcelled tarns. It took a moment for the humble farmer's son to position himself before, what looked to the average person, a simple puddle of water. He spoke the enchantment the knight had taught him, and before him shimmered the first image of Laverne's lair. Staring at him was Rimrunt, a relatively young narcissist who had only left his mirror to hunt for food and treasure, and that was very rarely. Martin splashed the puddle before he could catch the dragon's eye, thus ending the charm. He quickly moved to the next watery portal. Repeating the spell, another drake appeared. This one was Zimrod, a familiar, disgusting face. The fierce winged lizard was dread among the distant lands he inhabited, but he, too, liked to admire his reflected image. The knight had stolen from this beast before, but on this day there would be no raid. Already bored, Martin disturbed the waters and inched over to the next pool. Speaking the charm, an image of a sparkling mound of gold and silver coins appeared. The night's watcher grew excited. There was no dragon in view. From the cave's markings, it looked like Daigaria's lair. She must be out hunting, he thought. Look at that pile of treasure. How easy would it be to slip into the reflection and grab a handful? A beautiful golden drake entered the purview of the scene, dashing Martin's dreams of an easy spoil. Drat it, dragon. He splashed the water and pouted. He composed himself and moved to the next small tarn more determined than ever. If given the chance, he would cross the mirrored boundary between his world and a dragon's bounty. Once more, Martin spoke the secret enchantment, and a new image wavered into recognition. It was the lair of Ulven, the Slayer. He was a monstrous brown fire dragon who terrorized villages located some thousand leagues to the north. The knight had often stolen from him, for Ulvan, it seemed, was always on the hunt. The slayer must be absent in his cavern, Martin thought, for that mountainous pile of sapphire and rubies, jewels and jewelry, silver and gold is without guard once again. A twinge of conscience cautioned the young man to send up the flare and await the knight to come and dare the thieving deed. But gazing upon the massive prize, Martin espied an especially lustrous gem. An emerald it must be, the size of which he had never before encountered, let alone imagined. It lay among the heap like a gleaming beacon, calling for him to come and simply snatch it. Quickly squelching any inhibition, the Watcher spoke of second enchantment, one he heard the knight utter on numerous occasions, and threw himself into the pool that encased the image. 
The next instant, Martin was stepping out of a mirror and into the Wavern's lair. Ulven was nowhere to be seen. The emerald was all that could be seen. It enraptured the young man. It bewitched him. He had to have it. As he moved to the Mound of Treasure, the Mound of Treasure rose up before him. No, not the treasure. Up rose the head of a dragon whose emerald eye glistened in lust and vengeance. The jewels and rubies and coins that had hidden the drake cascaded down atop the cavern's invader. In a rasping inferno of a voice, the fierce dragon spoke. You are no knight who caught my eye, but you will do. The last thing Martin knew was the roar of Ulvan the Slayer's fiery breath. It is always a privilege to uncover veteran melodic death metal heroes, and since 1999, Era 10X has stayed the course, launching three great albums followed by Dark Awakening, which comes out this June from MDD Records. All the way from Hanau in Germany, this is Era 10X with Path of Revenge.
Electronic Visions is a synthwave artist from the Netherlands with three great albums and a slew of wonderful singles in their arsenal. Whether diving into deep blue emotion or raising it with sonic sunlight, Electronic Visions is an artist with music you should be listening to. Playing Tales of Forgotten Biomes, released in 2024, this is Electronic Visions. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on this quest. I'll see you soon again, my friends. Safe journeys. <laughs>